Leadership is taking people on a journey where there is a vision, guidance and purpose. Good leaders lead with the heart as well as the head. Leadership means doing the right thing for the right reason, no matter how difficult it might be. You're listening to Leadership Unwrapped, a podcast where you will hear from people who are living leadership every day. You know, Neve, I really didn't know what to expect when we invited Joe to um, to do a talk with us around his books, especially the book, The Myth of Leadership. Um, it's unusual for me to be midway through a book and suddenly just email somebody and say, yeah. come and do this. And, and I did it before I could talk myself out of it. And, and, and because I thought, oh, he's he's such a an accomplished author and so internationally renowned that he, he won't have time for us. But I just did it and he immediately came back and said that he'd love to. I think his work is really amazing and uh, I think it's really influenced me. It's really helped me. There's a lot to be said for picking up a book um, in an airport as you're passing through because yeah. it completely has blown my mind. And um, yeah, I, he, brilliant to talk to. Yeah. And like, I think I know I said this um, at some point throughout the recording as well, but, you know, leadership is such a, a vast concept and, you know, the the little nuggets of wisdom, the little practical takeaways that he gives that are that are not so little, you know, they're yeah, huge yeah, in yeah. someone's leadership journey. Um, and I, ju- I th- just think the way he breaks it down um, is fantastic. And I think there's there's something to get for for everyone who's who's in leadership or interested in going into leadership from this conversation. Um, and it dispels a lot of the the yeah the myths like the rumors or the misunderstandings about leadership that are out there as well because there are lots of them um mm-hmm. so it's yeah it's it's a re- it's a brilliant book it's a brilliant conversation and um I'm looking forward to because he has over 20 books so I'm really looking yeah, forward yeah. to to engaging with the other content that he yeah. has out there as well because yeah it was just a, a yeah. pleasure so um yeah I'm gonna do more yeah. of that emailing people Which yeah <laughs> Our guest today is Joe Owen, best-selling and multi-award winning leadership author, keynote speaker and social entrepreneur. And Joe's website is iLeadGuru. We'll put some of this information up with the episode because after listening to our chat, I think you're going to want to have a look. Joe is the author of more than 20 books translated into more than 20 languages. He's a founder of eight NGOs, including Teach First. Some titles of note among his many books, and I really recommend you have a look at them, are Smart Leadership, The Ultimate Handbook for Great Leaders. Other books include Smart Work, The Ultimate Handbook for Remote and Hybrid Teams, The Leadership Skills Handbook, 100 Essential Skills You Need um, for Great Leadership, The Mindset of Success, And I love the next title, which is Management Stripped Bare, What They Don't Teach You in Business School, which I think would be an important read. Global Teams and a book on resilience. We'll add details of where to find all of this information with the episode. But the book that stopped me in my tracks and led me to email Joe with a request to do this podcast before I had the time to talk myself out of it or imagine that he might say (laughs) no, was the book called The Myths of Leadership, Dispel the Misconceptions and Become an Inspirational Leader. So uh, then I emailed Joe because it's a book that in from reading it myself, I think it just helps leaders breathe, calm down, demystify all of the perfectionism that we have around leadership. And it's a book that really gives hope. So, Joe, a heartfelt welcome to you to Leadership Unwrapped and just a huge, huge thank you for saying yes. We were absolutely delighted. Thanks for joining us this morning. Trisha and Nima, it's absolutely wonderful uh, to be with you. You're getting me to talk about my favourite subject, which is leadership. I'm a complete leadership junkie. I look at it from every single angle, whether it's uh, businesses, adventurers, special forces, tribes around the world, wherever it is, I'm always looking at it through the angle of of leadership. It's a sort of wonderful journey. So I'm delighted that uh, we're able to go on this journey together. That's brilliant. What brought what brought you to this? What 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 drives that passion? And you are super passionate about it from even the chat we've had before this. So what drives that? And how did you end up here? So I am an accidental guru on leadership. <laughs> uh, when we started Teach First, uh, that's where it all started for me. Uh, we, we started with possibly the world's worst value proposition, which was join, come and join Teach First for twice the grief and half the salary you can get <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> We realized we had to improve that a little bit. So we uh, landed up focusing on this leadership proposition. 
uh, and said, you know, you'll, you'll be the leaders of the future and we'll give you a leadership course to help you uh, on, on this journey. Uh, 185 brave souls uh, believed what we were offering. There was one small problem. We didn't have a leadership programme. We didn't know anything about leadership and we couldn't afford to pay for a leadership programme. So at that point, I thought, well, fine, I'd better put a programme together. So I started by going and asking some very eminent people, what is leadership? And each person came back and said, well, let me tell you, leadership is A, B and C. And I'm like, oh, very good, I'd write that down. And I'd go to the next person and back and said, well, let me tell you, leadership is D, E and F. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. And I sort of slowly worked my way, way through the alphabet of leadership. Mm. And I realised that none of these leaders actually knew what leadership was. I'm like, isn't that interesting? Yeah. They're successful people, but they don't have a clue what leadership is. And so really, I've spent the last 20 years trying to figure out, well, what is leadership? And I, I'd like to say I've got the answer. I don't think anyone has the whole answer, but I, I'm beginning to get a little bit more confident about what I do know and what I don't know, but it's a continuing journey. It's great. It's actually. Yeah. I love it. That was one of the most, like, I've a few notes I'd taken when I was reading down through the book, and that was the first thing that really stuck out to me, the myth that was that we know what leadership is. And it was, as you say, people were defining leadership in the sense of um, like their character and how they wanted to portray leadership, which is really, really interesting because it's like the whatever all of us identify as good leadership is what we aspire to be, really, isn't it? But it that, that's not the same as your neighbour next door and even the three of us on the call here. It's really interesting. And that is interesting. So, so people do define leadership around what they do mm. or what they want to do. And at one level, that makes absolute perfect sense because this goes to a bit of a leadership conundrum which is this that that you can't succeed by trying to be someone else right mm. so so if you try to be one of these other leaders that says leadership is p q and r when you're a sort of d e and f type person you're gonna fail right mm. so that just doesn't work but equally if you just try to be yourself you know you sort of hang around like a teenager in full hormonal angst waiting for the world to recognize your innate genius and brilliance you're going to have a very long wait yeah. so at this point you go well blimey we're stuffed aren't we because we're not going to succeed by being someone else and we're not going to succeed just by being ourselves so we may as well give up well actually there is a solution to that which is the way to be an effective leader is to discover how to be the very best of who you are. Mm. Um, and then, that's not enough, find the context in which your strengths shine. And then make sure that you treat every day like opening night, not like the hundredth night of performance. This is opening night. It is a performance and I am going to perform to the best of who I mm. am, which means, of course, everyone has a completely unique leadership yeah. formula. That's good because they get what works for them in their context, which gets onto the question then about how do you learn leadership? If it's completely unique for everyone. So this is something I ask groups quite often. I say, well, how have you learned leadership? And actually, you, you, you might try this. OK, so wh why don't you try this? I give people six options. And I give them two votes, so you can have two votes. You can pick two major sources about how you have learned to lead. And here they are, right? So I'll try and remember them. Books, courses, bosses, good and bad lessons, peers, inside and outside work, role models, and experience. Okay, so books, courses, bosses, peers, role models, and experience. Okay, just think about that. Hmm. Now, your two votes. When I do with this with groups, virtually no one votes in favour of books or courses, which is a little bit of a disaster for an author that does leadership yeah. courses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, vote a couple everyone. Of there, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll read my books there, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Everyone votes 
for either second-hand experience, either so bosses, yeah. peers, role models, okay, or personal experience, which makes perfect sense. Mm. But there's a problem with that. Because if you rely on experience, you're committing yourself to a random walk and a slow walk because it takes a long time to build experience, okay? And if you bump into the wrong bosses, role models, etc., you are in a career cul-de-sac and that doesn't help you. So experience is great for the customization, contextualization of finding out what works for you, but you need some way of accelerating that journey and putting some structure on that journey and helping you make sense of the nonsense that you encounter day to day. That's the point of books mm. and courses. Yeah. You can't mm. start a book mm. at page one and finish at page 257 as the perfect leader. And this, of course, you read one of my books. Sorry, I do have to say that. <laughs> we agree. Um, but, but you can use the book to make sense of your experience, structure your learning and accelerate your learning. Yeah. So leadership is one of those very odd things. It can't be taught, but it must be learned. Yeah. And yeah. books and courses are actually the aid to your learning. They're not teaching you. They're aiding your journey of discovery. You've now discovered one of the eternal truths is talking to me. All you have to do is press the green button called go. And I just go on the subject of leadership because I just find it so endlessly fascinating. So there we go. <laughs> but I th I think the piece around the books is, and the courses is also important because it takes you out of your echo chamber. I mean, you do learn from experience, but it will stay in the context that it's in. And there's a lot to be learned from other contexts which come through in the writing that people do in that books and courses and networking. I've been so keen in my leadership research. If you, if you look at a lot of the leadership literature, it's all about this is what we do in America, yeah. right? We, and they do a lot of really good things in America, incidentally. But that very American-centric view of this is what leadership is about, this is what business is about, is actually very narrow and limited. So I, I deliberately look across cultures, across types of industry, from the largest to the smallest. And that is where I also do talk to like, you know, people in special forces, I've been on board the nuclear deterrent, I've been with the Marines, I've been uh, with adventurers and mountaineers and firefighters, um, and I've spent 15 years hanging out with tribes around the world, and, what, and, and obviously sports people and people like that. And once you see that huge diversity, you get outside the echo chamber, and that's where you begin to see, well, what are the what are the common elements and what are the bits that are completely con context specific mm. and that's yeah. what i try to pull through um yeah. in the writing yeah i th people can find that confusing i think because we talk about leadership as being so context specific which it is like you can't just lift something from one place and just implement it in a different setting and expect it to work the same way that it did elsewhere so it, it is so context specific but you do take other aspects of leadership, whether it's from other leaders or whether it's from different settings or different countries or cultures or whatever it is, you can take those learnings and you can build them then into your own practice and what you think will work in your own context. Yeah. So it doesn't mean that the two contradict each other. And the other thing that, that I was thinking when we're talking about the benefits of books and courses is it gives people a language for these things as well. A lot of the time, I think people can relate what's in books and courses to certain aspects of their own experiences, but it gives them a new lens and a language to be able to discuss and process that experience. Does that make sense? That does make perfect sense. And I think you've, you've you hit, and I love the point about the, the common language. Um, but I, I think you made the perfect point about how people learn from experience. They, they do learn by observing that you know, somebody else has done this actually quite smart and clever thing. They think, oh, I'll try a bit of that. And then they observe somebody else step on a landmine and go, well, actually, I won't step there. Thank you very much. Yeah, and that's yeah. really helpful. I think to Patricia's point, the danger is you just learn it in this echo chamber which works in that echo chamber, that's good. But actually, Neem, to your point, 
it's really helpful to just look outside the echo chamber, challenge yourself. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's hugely exciting and invigorating and refreshing because you you just see things differently. When you're living in the echo chamber, it's a bit like living life in in monochrome. It's kind of dull. Get outside the echo chamber Mm -hmm. and suddenly you're living life in technicolor um with the record button on and, and it's all a bit terrifying you know, as when i hang out with the tribes and all that but actually that's that that's the best yeah. times when you're having to challenge yourself and you, and people talk about the growth mindset you know it's when you challenge yourself you really feel you're growing because yeah. suddenly like oh this is all different ah, how, how does it work um which is, is, is a great, great excuse for going on holiday isn't it because yeah. it just kind of gets you out of it yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just so happens yeah <laughs> just so happens. I, I love in the one of the themes that you that comes through the book a few times and it's related to, to what you've just said for me is you you refer to henry kissinger kissinger as a ah. leader uh, describing a leader as someone who takes people where they would not have yeah. got by themselves Th- it this sounds is to huge. me like you're doing it yourself in your research and you're develop you're taking yourself into places you wouldn't have gone yeah. before to learn about leadership and it really underpins your philosophy of leadership which is that piece yeah. of being the catalyst that brings people further than they would have thought they would have gone. Loved it. Loved that idea. Do you well, want to chat not, a bit about that? Yeah. So so Kissinger turns out to be really important in this because there are lots of people who talk about leadership. So the first thing to do to set them is say, well, what is leadership? Okay. And normally what you'll get is a lot of fluff and flannel. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what you discover is that um people literally don't know what leadership is and if you don't know what leadership is i'm sorry you just don't know what you're talking about so you do need a working definition i've looked at lots of definitions most of them fail dismally like work uh, leaders have followers yeah well you know instagram you know influencers have followers are they leaders no mm-hmm. okay um so kissinger's definition is devastatingly effective you know leaders take people where they would not have got by themselves at first, my reaction was to fall asleep with boredom when I read that. So before you fall asleep with boredom, don't, because this is both devious, it's Kissinger, and it's revolutionary. Leaders take people where they would not have got by themselves. That means there are plenty of people at the top of organisations with grand titles such as, I don't know, chief executive, president, prime minister. They're not leading. They're not leading. They're simply following. Uh, yeah, they're following popular opinion. They're doing what anybody else would have done anyway, which isn't bad. That's OK. But they're not leading. Equally, there may be someone. I was talking to a porter, hospital porter yesterday. OK. And he talked to me about how all the wheelchairs in the hospital were always in the wrong place. and. It was a nightmare and nobody was allowed to do anything about it. So he just reorganized it. And guess what? Suddenly all the wheelchairs are in the right place. Everyone's really happy and it's, you know, brilliant. Mm. Porter by title, leader by action. So leadership has nothing to do with your title. It's everything about what you do. If you are taking your team or the wheelchairs or whatever it is where they would not have got by themselves, you are leading. Yeah. And that's great. That's liberating. So you don't need to wait 20 years before you get the corner office, before you can consider yourself a leader. You know, the day you start work, you can start leading. Mm -hmm. But that means you've got to step up, take a risk and do what you believe is right. Like hospital porter, because... You know, nobody gave him permission to do that, but he did it because that's the right thing to do. Yeah, it's great. What do you think motivates some people to naturally be there and others not? You know, another porter would have just went, I'm really annoyed about that, but let it because on high has said this is not happening, so it's not happening. So, so, often okay. wonder so I, I think there are several things. In 20 years of looking at leadership, I've started by looking at all the skills of leaders. And and on balance, a skilled leader is going to be better than 
an unskilled leader, all things being equal. And, and there's a suite of skills that you can sort of more or less get better at, like delegating and motivating and all that kind of good stuff and goal setting. Um, yeah, that's fine. Mm. But as any look at the very best leaders, the ones who really make a difference and stir things up, and it's obvious that they're not the most skilled. Now, that there's a reason for that, which is when you're in the shadows, those very modest weaknesses, sorry, we don't have weaknesses, we have development opportunities, don't we now? Mm. Um, it's just some of us have crushing <laughs> development opportunities, that's all. Yeah. Um, you know, th those mild development opportunities sort of get ignored and, because you don't, they're not so visible in, in the shadows. Once you step out into the limelight, of leadership spotlights on you and those tiny flaws suddenly look a lot lot yeah. bigger so yeah. first message is don't worry about your weaknesses as a leader there is no such thing as the perfect leader we all have weaknesses and actually leadership is a team sport so yeah. if you're weak at something get somebody else to do it for you like i hate accounting i can do it but i hate accounting so i love accountants i just yeah. think they're absolutely mm -hmm. wonderful and i've now lost the train so anyway but that there's one point about yeah. um uh you can't be the perfect leader yeah. and find your context it's a team sport work around your weaknesses yeah. um i love that in the book actually because you, you you say that so clearly you're saying you know you don't have to be good at everything you, you just need to know what your strengths are and, and play to them or lead into them and then find yes. the people, make the people who have the skill that love to do the things that you don't love to do, make them an essential part of your team. Um, makes absolutely yes. perfect sense. And, and this is interesting because if you look at it, in the past, the, le the leader had to be the smartest person in the room. Yeah. In fact, the leader always had a knowledge advantage. So, um, but this, this is changing. The knowledge advantage of leaders has gone. Um, and it's gone for several reasons, the most important of which is that compared to the uneducated kind of working masses of the 19th century, that's history. You're probably now going to be managing professionals who have probably got degrees. Uh, standard mm -hmm. operating pro procedure for a professional is they probably think management is a waste of space and they, they could do your job better than you can anyway. Right. So now you have to manage people who are probably going to be at least as smart as you and probably smarter than you. And you've also got generative AI coming along. So, you know, that means that all the mundane stuff, you know, generative AI can do. So if in the past leaders succeeded because they had the knowledge advantage, that advantage has gone completely. So that's the first challenge that leaders face today. The second challenge really is the challenge of control. Mm. Because in the past, bosses basically controlled what they needed to control, mm. right? The job of management was fairly easy. You passed orders down the hierarchy and in information back up the hierarchy, yeah. more or less. Okay, That's for the birds, because now you probably have to make things happen through people who may not even be in your firm. They may be partners, suppliers, stakeholders, etc. You know, the, the old idea of the firm as the medieval walled city where all of life was encompassed within, that's for the birds. Fun, you know, yeah. Firms are much more specialised and focused. But even within your span of control, you're now managing these professionals who don't want to be controlled and you're having to make things happen through other departments that yeah. have competing agendas. And in fact, your your biggest competition is not in the marketplace. Your biggest competition is sitting at a hot desk near you, competing with the same limited pot of management yeah. resources, time and promotions. Yeah. So welcome to this new world where, first of all, you've lost the knowledge advantage. And second, you've lost the control that managers used to have. And actually, that makes this the most exciting and challenging time ever to be in leadership mm. and management, because it means we've now need to raise our game and change our game. We have to say, well, where do we really add value and what are the skills we really need as managers? And what I'd argue is that if you look back you know, 19th century, 
you had to be the smartest person in the room. So that was IQ, the knowledge advantage. Mm. Yeah, have better IQ than uneducated people, not a high bar to write or uh, go for. 20th century, the workers got educated, so you needed, yeah, you know, they could do more, but expect more, they expect to be treated like humans. So you needed EQ, you know, emotional mm. quotient, you had to deal with people. But IQ and EQ are no longer enough in this world of, of um, loss of knowledge, advantage, loss of control. The best managers and leaders have another set of skills around aligning agendas, mm. building those networks of trust, you know, getting the right priorities, pushing things forwards, dealing with conflict, all those very, very difficult things, which I call PQ, political yeah. quotient. And it's a new mm. skill. Well, it's not yeah. a new. PQ has always been around, but it's now become you know, much more into the spotlight as this is the skill set that differentiates the, the very best from the rest. And sense, that's a, a, yeah. my current area of focus and research. And people are getting very, very excited about it because yeah, everyone's going, yes, this is yeah. what it is. You know, plenty yeah. of people. I see people. Yeah, you know, they say, I see plenty of people who you know, have good IQ and EQ, but they're languishing. It's these people who can do all this yeah. more EQ stuff of making things happen that are successful. Yeah. Okay, so you've got to think about yeah. how do you build, and it sounds Machiavellian, but it's not. It's all about the core of it is how do you build those networks of trust so that you become the colleague that people want to work for and with not the colleague that they have to work with so yeah, yeah. it's very odd in this highly highly competitive world you'd think it becomes machiavellian it's the opposite in this highly competitive world you need friends you need allies so this is all about creating those networks trust we're into the yeah you need the trust advantage not the knowledge advantage yeah. I had the same reaction. I got a really, when I read it in the book, I just went, that just yeah. makes perfect sense to me. And you had written that leadership is becoming more challenging. 21st century leaders need to make things happen through people they don't control. That was your political quotient. Influencing, building networks of trust, support, aligning agendas, fighting the right battles, which I thought was really thoughtful too. Mm. And couple that with the emotional quotient, the emotional sure. intelligence as well. It just captured how leadership has changed. I think you, you just put your finger on the pulse of it when you when you wrote that. I think you, you, you I'm, I'm glad I'm consistent in what I say. Yeah, right, you occasionally, have so. very much so. Yeah. <laughs> but but I think, again, <laughs> what I'm trying to do is, is, is what you referred to earlier here which is to give people a new language for this, because is that what, what is the language between IQ and EQ? Everyone gets IQ and EQ, but what's mm. this language around aligning agendas, trust, influence, all that kind of good stuff? And if, if PQ can be thought of as the language, and then what you can do is focus on that and say, well, mm. what exactly are the skills? And, and you know, trust is a skill and it can be learned, for instance. But you, you've then got to unpack it and go, well, what is that? Yeah, let's. Can we talk a little bit about trust? I, I, I was really curious. In your book, you you use an equation for trust, and you you, and you talk about the importance of trust. That that it hinge, it all hinges on trust. I was, I, can I? So I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. But I was reading about yeah. the honesty <laughs> section. I'm getting all excited now. But I was reading in the honesty section, and in it, you challenge a little bit around authentic leader, how we think about authentic leadership. And um, what I was really taken with the piece about the, the, the leader who you quote, who says, my mask has made all the difference. There's a, there's a difference between honesty and discretion. I can do more damage in being the authentic, honest than the discreet, bringing somebody to where they need to be. And then you talked about trust and I was just blown away. I was like, oh, this is really important. So, well, we can come on to trust. Let, let, let's deal with the authenticity and honesty. Uh, look, um, both are... Both are important, okay? So you want someone, if, if we go back to, um, you have to be the best of who you are to succeed, mm -hmm. right? That That's the authenticity bit. And no one's gonna work with, what or want to work with a dishonest leader because actually, although honesty comes up as one of the top five expectations of a leader, when I looked under the bonnet of what do you actually mean by honesty, 
time again they actually is it's about trust okay mm. i don't want to work so so authenticity and honesty are important but there is a dark side to both honesty yeah. and uh, authenticity the dark side to authenticity is this um do you really want to work for a psychopath who is authentic yeah. or, yeah. authentically psychopathic yeah. okay mm-hmm. yeah and mm-hmm. and we do all have habits well, look we all have habits which patently work for us because otherwise we would not have got here okay so we should celebrate that but you also have habits that hold us back occasionally mm. and if we authentically indulge in the habits that are unhelpful to us yeah that's not going to work either so yeah. that is the point at which you need to wear this mask of leadership and that mask is this is the mask of who i am when i am at my best and mm. that is goes back to you know every day is a performance every day is first night make it the first night today mm. okay so so that's the authenticity mm. bit see the honesty bit i would challenge anyone to survive one day at work being really authentic <laughs> in terms of their thoughts yeah. about <laughs> yeah how yeah what what they think of their boss what they think of their colleagues what they think of you know yeah if you actually spoke your mind about what you were really thinking about everyone else i don't think you'd last an hour actually <laughs> would you I'm, 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 or may, maybe you all have incredibly kind and generous thoughts about everyone all the time <laughs> But I, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I, if I actually I'm... spoke my mind clear. So there is a bit about, and I, I, I was actually interviewing a, a, a wonderful headhunter, so you know, reversing the, the tables last week. And when she came into the room, she, she was a wonderful person. She said, oh, she said, I've, I've put on so much weight. Oh, but it's so good to see you. And I said, I, I said, you're looking wonderful. I said, and we sat down. And at the end of the interview, she said, yeah, when I, when I came in and said, I put on so much weight. If you turned around to me and said, "Yes, you have put on quite a bit of weight," I'd be really, yeah. really insulted. <laughs> exactly. You yeah. said you're looking wonderful, and so yeah. yeah. So there is this bit about yeah, you, you. Yeah, there's potential carnage. I think. Oh, carnage. <laughs> if if everyone was really honest, I just I yeah. hate to think what would happen. Yeah, but but there but. And there is a piece about that. I mean, the example you used, but but the person who if you sometimes you do need to be discreet. Like you know, you can't if somebody's engaging in a pattern of behaviour that's that's really pulling them back. You can't just straight out go there. That will only create a resistance. You need to find a way to. You talk in the book about having the difficult conversation positively to help the person see where they need to go. So it's it's a it's a the mask isn't about being fake. The mask is about to me, no. creating the strategies to Im- to empower the conversation no. so that it can happen. If the mask has to be the right. authentic, you it has to be the best of who you are. Yeah. But you, so so there is, uh, so what one of the characteristics of good leaders is courage, um, which at first is surprising. Mm. So courage really came up as a leadership characteristic when I was with the tribes because boy you re- you do do need real courage um, to face some very difficult situations there wow. and so in my research I sort of put that in as an option and it kept on coming up and I thought well but in the office you're not having mm. to face down wild animals and you know wild yeah. animals and everything like that so what's going on and the courage of a leader is the courage to have difficult conversations it's the courage to make difficult decisions. It's the courage to step up at those moments of crisis and ambiguity when no one else wants to step up or nobody else knows what to do. You know, and at those moments, they're moments of truth where followers step back, leaders step up, and followers are sensible because that's a survival strategy. You see what you know, what works and what doesn't work, and you know, when something's working, you you, you know, jump on the bandwagon, you're safe. But actually, the leaders go, no, I, yeah, I, this is important. I can see what needs to be done. Let's do it. I'm stepping up. Bang. And they don't even think of it as stepping up. It's just like, no, we need to do this. Let's do it. OK, so um, there is this huge bit uh, of leaders. And I was referring to earlier that the best leaders aren't the most skilled. 
but they actually behave differently because they think differently. Mm. And again, when you look at that, they all have consistent habits of mind. If we talk about mindset, that sounds like it's innate and about your DNA. It's not. They're habits of mind, and we can all learn habits of mind just like we learn any other habits. They all have consistent habits of mind which drive them to behave differently. And one of those habits is courage, which I just mentioned. Mm-hmm. At which point, well, I, and I was in a workshop and someone got up and said, yeah, but that's all very well. You can't learn courage, can you? Oh, God, I'm in trouble here. Luckily, at the back of the room, there was the chief of the local <laughs> fire service. So I said, OK, well, you know, you're firefighters. Yeah, they, they do you know, really brave things like mm-hmm. going into burning buildings and all that sort of stuff. So how do you teach your um, you know, firefighters to be so brave? So he gets up and says, right, first thing I want everyone into this room to know is uh, uh, I don't want a brave firefighter. So that was a face palm moment because it's like, yeah. you know, that, there's my question gone. Yeah, so, yeah, because yeah. a brave firefighter is a dead <laughs> firefighter and dead firefighters are so, so fine. Okay. So how do you get ordinary people to land up going into burning building to save other people? And he said, well, that's easy, he said. Day one, we get them to you know, learn how to put on some simple kit, like you know the boots or the jacket or the helmet or whatever it is. Day two, we might learn, get them to figure out how to put out a fire in a chip pan. Day three, we might let, get them to learn to use a small step ladder. And over time, you know, the fires get bigger, the ladders get longer, the kit gets more sophisticated, and the scenarios get more difficult. And by the end of it, you know, a, a burning building is like a day at the office. That's how you do it. Yeah. Okay, fine. I then spent time with the Royal Marine Commandos, who do seriously dangerous stuff. I mean, seriously, and you can agree with it or dis- disagree with it, but boy, yes. Their pre-service uh, training instruction starts with a one and a half mile run in, I think, I think 10 minutes. Uh, and, and then after well, three months of that and 18 months in service training, they're, they're doing this crazy nonsense. And it is exactly the same as the firefighters. It's yeah, small incremental steps, structured training and supervised training. And eventually they all land up doing things which look incredibly brave and courageous, but you and me are like, well, to them, it's like a day in the office. Yeah. But as with leadership, mm-hmm. all things to do with leadership, it is contextual. So I was talking to someone who uh, does extraordinary trips, you know, across the most inhos- inhospitable deserts in the world and just thinks that they're sort of like, that. that's easy stuff. Again, courage. And at the end of the interview with me, he said, yes, but he said, try getting me to sell double glazing. I wouldn't sell, uh, survive a day. Mm. Okay. So so all of this is contextual and it can be learned. And that's great news for all of yeah. us. Yeah, it and is. it's just brilliant. You, you don't have to be a superhero. All of this can be learned. And if courage can be learned, you can learn anything. Yeah. And I think that's the joy of the book to me when I was reading it. There was just a there was it it just helps the shoulders go down a bit because some of this you it can be learned. And I was very struck with the firefighter um story in the book. But um and they also talked about you 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 get you you become able to recognize the patterns and to be able to make the decisions based on the patterns. So you become experienced the more that you do it and and it and that they're going in with a very clear mindset of recognizing pattern and 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 being able to to stay but safe. I thought it was incredible. Good way of so so again, that's what a lot of you know, firefighters and marines and all that are doing is it's pattern recognition ultimately. But that is what a lot of management and leadership is about. So when people talk about this person has got business smarts, I'm like, what on earth does that mean? <laughs> yeah. What's that mean? Yeah. What it means is that they've got good pattern recognition. So. How do you, so, so the challenge is, how do you learn pattern recognition? I'm going to give you two ways of, of doing it. First way I learned was when I started work uh, on the DAS brand, DAS being you know, the, the uh, oh, yeah. washing detergent. I put the blue speckle in DAS, so that's yeah. my claim oh. to fame. Oh, wow. Um, I started <laughs> so cool. by going into a darkened room for eight hours 
where I watched every single piece of DAS advertising for 50 years. Okay, wow. it's like a social history of Britain, starting with 90 mm. second epics, 90 seconds for an ad- advertisement. It's like a feature movie going down to sort of 20 second bursts of sensory overload. And critically, with each piece of advertising, there was the associated research which showed how much impact it had, okay, called day after research. So you know you knew how effective it was. By the end of eight hours, I had this uncanny ability to be able to predict how effective each piece of advertising was. Why? Just because I'd seen the patterns repeatedly non-stop until I was sick in the face of watching Daz advertising. (laughs) So that's all pattern recognition is. So how can you be expert at advertising and knowing this bit of advertising will score 63% and that piece will score 72%? Well, you know, you've seen it that often. So that is sort of good. But then how do you accelerate that learning? How do you accelerate that learning? Um, And this goes back to learning from experience. And here's what you can do. We're always bumping into good and bad experiences during the day. So what I urge people to do is this. After any important call, a meeting, whether it's gone well or badly, just take 30 seconds, one minute, as you walk from one meeting room to another, or as you go to get a cup of tea after a call and ask yourself two questions. Here they are, WWW and EBI. So WWW, what went well? What did I do well in that call? What did I do well in that meeting? What did I do well in that presentation that actually I want to learn from, okay? A lot of people are talk about you know, learning from setbacks and you know, that's very vivid, but that's a painful way to learn. They're often very bad at learning from success, but actually you've got to create your own success formula for what works for you in your context. So when you find yourself doing something that works, that's like gold dust. Capture that gold dust. What went well? What went well? Keep on asking yourself that. And it kind of cheers you up as well. I mean, yeah, it's a nice and positive as well, so that's good. Yeah. And then everyone says, yeah, but, but what if it was a total disaster? And I go, if it was a disaster, then you really should ask WWW because yeah. there's you probably did something in that disaster that prevented it from becoming an unmitigated catastrophe. And that's yeah. <laughs> like gold dust. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but and then they go, all right, fine. Mm-hmm. And then they push me even further and say, Yeah, but you probably did something wrong. I mean, you know, come on, what, what do you do about the stuff you're all messed up with? And I said, Well, first of all, you don't want to ask WWW's evil twin, which is what went wrong. Because that will just depress you. And if you ask it in a team setting, that's just a recipe for politics and backstabbing. So instead, you ask a more positive question, which is EBI. Even better if. It would have been even better if. So let me give you an example. I do this with sales teams quite often. After a sales call, you ask WWW and EBI, and the sort of EBIs they come up with are things like, well, it would have been better if I'd asked more questions. It would have been even better if I'd listened more and talked less. It would have been even better if I'd actually done a little bit more preparation mm-hmm. on the client. Okay, Now, that, that sounds positive, and everyone's like, yeah, that's great. You know, I'll, I'll remember and do that. Okay, good. If you turn that around, like did what went wrong? It's like, well, well, for a start, you didn't ask any questions, you talked too much, and you didn't do any preparation. Mm. At which point you've got a fight on your hands. Yeah. Mm. Now, of course, EBI and what went wrong, you've said the same thing. Yes. But you come to a completely different place. Mm. So this is how you get experience speed without having to wait for 20 years after every meeting every call that's important just ask yourself www ebi and do it with your team as well it's a great way of the team learning and it doesn't take long 
for two minutes with the team, just mm -hmm. www.ebi, and it becomes a kind of instinctive uh, reaction. And that's how you learn what works for you in yes. your context speed. Yeah. As well as reading my books, of course. Sorry, <laughs> Obviously. But these practical insights that you give, Joe, are just so important because in the leadership field, I suppose you're wading through so much, just so much content and some of it, you know, is is important and some of it, you know, you you feel like you can take something away from and other bits you just don't understand at all. And there's just so much, besides even when we think about the literature that's out there, the actual expectations of leaders are just becoming more and more complex as time goes on. And you, you alluded to it earlier, you used the, the term Superman earlier when you were talking. It was something that I actually really wanted to ask you about, because in one of the myths, you're talking about uh, being humble as a leader. So you, you kind of phrase it as like, now it's not enough to be, you know, visionary, charismatic, all those things that, you know, are typically <laughs> kind of um, expected of a leader. And now you're required to be humble as well. And that Superman does this quite well. And it was just like, you know, it, it just really hit home with me because it's one of those things that when you're talking to people about leadership, it seems so vast and the expectations just seem so crazy. And you can see in people's faces, you know, particularly like because I mean, we're all interested in it here and, you know, researching it, writing about it and things like that. And it can be just so daunting. So that's why I think it's really important what you're doing when you're when you're breaking it down and you're creating a space where it's like it's OK to acknowledge that we don't know everything. And it's OK to say that, you know, we we need to do this as a team. And it's OK to, you know, say that even though this, this expectation is there, it's like an expectation of Superman, you know, and putting it out there like that. So it's it's brilliant what you're doing. So, so you look at the expectations of a leader. Yeah, that is a cornucopia of contradictions. Mm. Yeah, mm. humble and um, uh, yeah, ambitious, strategic and detailed. Yeah, uh, motivational and controlling. Yeah, yeah it's all, all these things. And it's like it's nonsense. It goes back to what we were talking earlier that that every leader is unique. You have to find your own unique strengths, mm -hmm. build on those strengths. Look, I mean, is is it? I think of the Olympics, right? So so. Olympic weightlifters, you know, they have to focus on weightlifting. You don't go to an Olympic weightlifter and say, you know what, your synchronized swimming skills aren't quite yeah. up to snuff. I think you need to spend more time on synchronized yeah. swimming. I'm mean, like, no, that, that's not how yeah. they're going to succeed. They're going to succeed at being, you know, lifting weights or whatever weightlifters do, right? Just focus on that. So, so that sounds obvious. But it's not mm, no. because it raises the question of actually what what are you actually good at? Mm -hmm. What are you good at as an individual? And where do you add value as a manager and leader? You don't add value by simply taking on the most difficult tasks of your team. That's what your team is there for. Right. So you have to. It's like. It's like the problem of the, the you know, great football player or whatever it is that gets made into the coach. And they go, oh, great, you know, that now means I've got to work twice as hard to prove my worth. So I'm going to you know, make run twice as hard, score twice as many goals, make twice as many tackles. No, that, that's not your point. That's not your role as a coach. Yeah. And then they fail because they haven't realised that they don't add value by doing all the most difficult bits that the other players do. Mm -hmm. They add value by selecting the right team, by developing the team, by motivating the team, by getting the tactics right, by doing all of that. So be clear about what your role as a manager is and be clear about what your strengths are and play to those strengths. And if you can do that, then you have unlocked an awful lot about the, the nature of success. Yeah. Now, the big trick in that is actually the rules of survival and success change at every level of the organization. Yeah. That's the bit. So and and they become and the rules become more ambiguous the further you go up the organization. So when you start out, it's pretty clear what you've got to do. I mean you're told what you need to do. You need to sell this, you need to write this code, you need to teach this class, whatever it is. Okay. And it's like it's pretty obvious what you've got to do. And if you do it well, and if and if you're seen to have the right attitude, and that's really important, you get promoted, 
right? Which is where your troubles start because suddenly, you know, you're, you're now the coach, you're not the player, and the rules have changed. And it becomes more ambiguous. And then it becomes more ambiguous, more people focused, and more political the further you go up the hierarchy. So at the very top, nobody tells you what the exam question is. You have to figure that out for yourself. You have to create the right exam question, and then you have to get other people to agree that that's the exam question. And then you have to get other people to help support you answer it. So it's a very, very different Mm -hmm. world uh, up there. And incidentally, not everyone wants to go there. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, you know what? All that management stuff is BS. I don't like it because actually you're far away from the action. I like being on the pitch, playing the game. That's where the action is. and That's what I want to do. And you know what? That's a great decision. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a fantastic decision. So just be clear about what what you want. Do you want to be on the play in playing field, playing the pitch, or do you want to be in the dugout coaching the team? Or do you want to be in the boardroom sort of managing the the club as it were? I mean, it's all they're all completely different roles. Yeah. Can I chat a little bit as well about the myth that psychopaths succeed as leaders? Because <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> my own work is around, I talk about the dark side of work culture. So a little bit of the Darth Vader stuff. So so I was really taken with what you had to say about this. And um, I, you talk about being a, be, beware of psychopaths because they're highly manipulative and they know how to lie and how to survive. And they've had plenty of practice. Somebody had said to me, you know, beware of very damaged people in the workplace because they know how to survive. So they're, they, you know, they have a skill set there that you might not be equipped for as a leader. But you, you say we need to seek to understand and not to judge them, which I think is really important. And then you can learn to to spot and how to deal with it. The more that the less judgmental you are, and the more curious you are, I suppose, in the position that you take around it. Um, but you say something that really stopped me in my tracks and it's, and I'm going to quote from the book to say, beware your firm. Firms like psychopaths will support you and be loyal to you in return for your loyalty and commitment until they no longer need you. And that's a, that's a narrative I've heard a bit, you know, how quickly you become forgotten when you move on from something or how much you invest. And then suddenly it's, it's something, it's a different direction and you're no longer the number one. Um, and it's yeah, terrifying. I mean, I, yeah. to that. So, so there are several bits in there. Um, I, I've seen this with uh, a CEO who uh, we agreed he had announced his re- uh, resignation. Put it that way, and yeah, you know, that happened. And and it, he wanted a graceful transition of like three months. So he said, "Fine, yeah, we'll, we'll let that happen." So. Uh, that that happened in the morning, and it was all in. A, there was an open plan office. Obviously, meetings were private and separate. And the day before, yeah, you could see the flow of people. All the people would sort of flow towards him, and decisions would. Da, 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 da. By the afternoon, nobody was going to his desk. Yeah, it was history already. Mm. Literally, you could see the power had moved. Yeah, and ha- so it happens that quickly even if you're the chief executive, which is a humbling thought. So you may want to think about how you're going to be remembered. And the answer is you will not be remembered for beating budget by 10.8% in 2023. You probably won't remember that yourself anyway, right? So think back on the leaders, colleagues that you most remember. Just think about one or two of those. Now think about what is it specifically they achieved? You might have a bit of a memory, a little bit sort of vague, and it may be right, maybe wrong. Now recall, what were they like? And I guarantee you're going to be able to make, well, they were like this and this and that, and you can't believe them. So we remember people very vividly for what they're like, not for what they do. Mm. So how are you going to be remembered? You're going to be remembered for how you are, not just for what you do. So choose well. It's your choice. Okay, That's how you're going to be remembered. Um, The psychopaths bit, 
psychopaths are really good at being psychopaths mm. okay don't compete with them mm. right just don't there's no point okay we can talk separately about how to deal with them but yeah that's a slightly longer uh, mm -hmm. discussion about that but there's a broader point about uh looking at colleagues and in particular bosses who are successful and you don't like we live, live in a very judgmental era where we go oh you know this person's an idiot i don't like that person oh this person you know has the wrong values therefore they're a bad person yeah. well that's great if you want to feel morally superior mm. wonderful congratulations you're now a morally superior person what have you learned nothing nothing okay yeah. so who's the fool now so instead of judging these people, and I've, I've had some terrible bosses, absolutely terrible, anywhere close to management. But then I've had to go, well, actually, you know, there's a reality here. They're the boss and I'm not. So maybe, just maybe, they've done something smart that I could learn from. Mm -hmm. So instead of going, they're idiots and I hate them and they're nasty people, I go, right, what is it that they do that has helped them become successful? Yeah. And I may want to learn from that, or I may say, actually, I don't, you know, if they've been successful because they've been a psychopath, I go, fine, I don't want to learn from that. Yeah. Right? yeah. But at least learn, understand, and then you've got a chance of making progress. But if you simply judge people, then congratulations, you're a morally superior person. Goodbye. Yeah. 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 That's it. Yeah. Because you talk about the characteristics. Bold and self-confident, stress-tolerant, risk-taking, charming and charismatic. And they are the type of skills that, that leaders, you know, are expected to have. But the dark side of it, you say, can lead to being amoral, lacking in empathy for others, etc. So there are things to be learned, but there are also values yeah. that you bring to the lens, I think. And so there are values. And I think the you know, my latest research on PQ, which we talked about, you know, building your networks of trust. This is this is where the psychopaths come unstuck because mm. they're quite good at winning the battles. They can in the short term, they can manipulate and motivate people. But over time, they land up basically messing so many people up. Their reputation precedes them and they yeah. lose the war because nobody yeah. trusts them. Nobody wants to work with them. So they'll win the battle, but lose the war. Unfortunately, mm. they cause a lot of damage mm. in the meantime. Now, so so that's the psychopaths bit but you talk about the dark side of leadership there is a dark side to leadership in the mindset of success i i said that you know the best leaders act differently because they think differently and they're they've got habits of mind one of the you know seven good habits is courage and there are you know, mm. six, six others as well I don't need to go through them now um but whenever i talk about that nobody wants to hear about the seven mind positive mindsets they always want to hear about the one mindset from yeah. the dark yeah. side <laughs> yeah. and yeah. so so here it is the so best leaders are actually ruthless mm. and when i say that to people leaders they go oh, no no i'm not ruthless and then i you know, recount some of the stories that they, they, mm. said, they said well maybe i've got a hard edge and it's like hard edge you know <laughs> it's ruthless okay and if they're being ruthless not because they're psychopaths and not because they're nasty and not because they're mean people, but because they have another habit uh, of mind, which is incredibly powerful. It's around vision and ambition. And it's not about ambition for themselves. It's about ambition and vision for their team, their organisation, their firm, whatever, mm. which is, yeah, here's where we need to get to. Here's where I want to take my school. Yeah, this is what we this is how the school in the future is going to be transformational for future generations. OK, brilliant, wonderful, exciting. I don't know what it's going to I don't know what vision is, but, you know, a, everyone has a mm -hmm. great. But then you find the head of English actually doesn't share that vision or doesn't have the capability to go there, doesn't have the motivation to go there. And that head of English happens to have been your best friend for the last 20 years. Yeah. So you fire her. And that was a head teacher that said she wasn't ruthless. <laughs> she just had a hard edge. And she wasn't doing that because she was a mean or nasty person. 
It was just that actually, if we don't do this, we are letting down generations of children. Mm. And that is immoral. So we're going to make that difficult decision. Yeah, yeah. So, so at some point, there is this hard edge to leadership. There is that ruthless bit where you do have to be able to prepare to step up, make the difficult decision, have the difficult conversation, and where necessary, be ruthless. Yeah. But there's a lot of positive stuff as well. So. Yeah. I'd love to come back and I, I mean, I know you're very busy, so, so I'm conscious of your time, but I'd love to come back and have this conversation in more depth as a as a theme for a podcast, because it certainly is something that's coming up a lot in my own research around. There's two things, there's perception, but there's reality. And, and I loved when you wrote about this myth, you said that this myth is built on a large dose of reality, but these don't make good leaders. And you've said, you know, you win the battle, but maybe lose the war. And that's what I see as I look at the trajectories of people over the years through uh, 25 years researching it now, but I'm seeing the same trend. So that's um, really, I'd thank, love to come thank back Thank goodness your, your proper research is confirming my... Yeah, absolutely uh, it is. I, I can, well, I, I, it, it, it does. I'm conscious of your time, but and I want to segue just slightly because before we started this, we had a really good conversation about television. And I'd love right. our listeners to, to hear your insight about this, but... So I asked you a question about how do you do it all? And then you... So yeah, you everyone says they're frightfully busy, okay? And, and at one level, that's true. We are all frightfully busy. But then you have to say, in what way are we being frightfully busy? So I just want to challenge people on this a little bit. First of all, how many emails do you really get before 8.30 in the morning or after 6 o'clock? You may get the odd one, but my experience, I get very, very few of them. And you know, if you get the train at eight o'clock on a Sunday morning, are you really being you know, killed in the commuter rush? So the evidence is, uh, oh, and how many meetings do you have to attend before 8.30 in the morning or after six? So if you actually look at it in, you know, and, and write it down in a diary, you'll find that actually you're not on 24-7. Curiously, you often feel you're on 24-7 mm -hmm. because we're dealing with so much noise day to day that even when we've stopped you know, doing the emails and the meetings, our mind is still going, oh, yeah, but I've still got to deal with that person and this meeting's coming up and what about that? And somebody's asked about this and, oh, gosh, have I remembered this? So in a sense, you're never quite switching off, which is a problem. And so you need to find a way of switching off. And incidentally, a to-do list is a very good way of doing it because once it's on the to-do list, you go, fine, I know what I need to do. I can forget it, okay? Um, so that's the first bit. The second bit is people say they just don't don't have time. Well, again, look at the statistics of how much time people spend on screens, watching television, uh, playing games on their iPhone uh, or whatever it is, um, or spending time on social media. And the answer is yeah, about five hours a day. Yeah. Right? five hours yeah. a day on mm, on average scary. now some people will do no time so for instance i just refuse to watch television that's kind of, so immediately i have hours back every day that's true. so you've got five hours a day someone said to you do you want five hours extra a day where you could do what you want most people would kill for that yeah you've got that if you want right yeah you've got that if you want so it's just a matter of being sort of really focused and disciplined and making conscious choices, conscious choices about how you spend your time and where your priorities are. Because so much time we just sort of randomly walk through the day, which means that actually a lot of our days are unproductive. We're just dealing with the noise. We're reacting to noise. We're reacting to stuff. Yeah. Which, of course, you've got to deal with stuff. But the question is, having spent the whole day getting slightly tense and frustrated dealing with stuff, have you made progress? Have you made progress? So that's about being really clear in your mind about what you want to achieve this year. That's nothing to you with your MBO. It's about what you personally want to achieve this year. It may be about learning a new skill. It may be about getting a new experience. It may be, I don't know what it is, okay? But be clear about this is the year or the 18 months or nine months, doesn't have to be, where 
this is what I'm going to do. Okay. And if you've got that clarity and focus, then you can deal with all the noise, but you can also give yourself confidence that you're moving forwards as well. So yeah, if you're feeling overwhelmed and everyone does feel overwhelmed, first look at your diary and then make sure you're actually using the time the way you want to use your time. And if you want to spend mm -hmm. your time watching soaps, that's fine. Yeah, No problem with that. But just be clear that that is your decision. OK. Yeah. And second, be really clear about what you personally want to achieve this year and next year. And, and I assure you, it is not about beating budget by 10.8 percent. Yeah. That, yeah. that, that isn't what it's about. Um, so if you can do those two things, be clear about what you want to achieve this year. Be clear about how you're using your time. Actually, you, you will set things get a lot better. Yeah. I'm wondering, Joe, just to wrap up, because you've given so many nuggets of wisdom there for our listeners to take away. If there's one thing that you'd love for our listeners to take away with them from after after listening to this podcast, what would it be? I, I, I go back to Kessinger. Yeah. Okay. Leaders take people where they would not have got by themselves. That's a really big and challenging test. You don't have to be a leader. That's OK. Being a manager, yeah, being a steward of a legacy is really hard work. It's important work. Be proud of that. But if you want to lead, that's your test. Take mm. people where they would not have got by themselves, because that's about have you got the vision and ambition? And once you've got the vision and ambition for the firm, not just for yourself, that will drive all the other behaviours that you need in terms of yeah. courage, um, resilience, positivity, collaboration, uh, and even ruthlessness. It will just mm -hmm. it just flips you into the right right behaviours, and and it'll be a wonderful journey. It'll be a roller coaster. The the lows will be very low. The highs will be very high. But it's a, just a wonderful and brilliant journey. So whatever your journey is enjoy it no it's fabulous yeah joe um it, for me it was meeting the person who's written the book that i wanted to write i just think this book is fabulous <laughs> um and i i hope our listeners will 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 pick it up because it gives you sustenance it gives you hope but it also it, it helps us kind of take the pressure off the being perfect in the leadership space and being a bit more human about it so um, I'm just over the moon that you said yes to us, that you would meet us. And I hope that we can continue the conversation. There's a lot more to chat about and a lot of overlap in our work. It's an absolute privilege to talk to you. I'd, I'd be very happy to, to continue that conversation. And also, I'm interested in that work you're doing. Um, uh, and maybe there is something we can talk about there, especially around Absolutely. that whole PQ agenda as well. Joe, okay. thank you right. so much. Thanks, Billy. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.